congratulations on this event. It's a pleasure to present to you. I'm going to talk to you about my work at the USC Center for Body Computing. So I direct the center that I founded um, 11 years ago, and our vision is for a world of personalized healthcare that's digital. You don't have to be in a bricks and mortar place to get it. Uh, that lowers costs and provides better outcomes. So this is healthcare for everybody in the world that scales on demand, um, and that's absolutely affordable because of all the costs that we'll take out uh, by needing to see people in bricks and mortar buildings or for countries having to build infrastructure. So it's about the future of medicine, that's software and services. And we've done a lot in our 11 years that we're proud of. We did some of the first research to show that connected devices improve outcomes with big data analytics. Those were in implantable devices. First research on patch sensors to show the importance of accurate uh, body sensing. We were the first to show a digital health study that showed a mortality reduction from connected care. And we work in some of the best performers in the world, not just in chronic disease, but in elite military and, athletic, and athletics with mostly sensors, performance, enhancement type work. We were the first to co record continuous heart rate during a Division I football game on every player on the field, which was really pretty interesting even if you're not into football. So um, we've led the way. We've held the first academic conferences in this area, first hackathons for VR, an active area for us, first to create digital health training programs for docs and others, and um, working with regulatory authorities all over the world, first global document to regulate software as a medical device. We're trying to do the same stuff in VR. So we like to think of ourselves as a serious academic center, and I got into this field because of the devices I implant in the heart, mostly defibrillator-type devices for heart failure, became connected in 2008, and I started doing a lot of research on what it means to be able to take information off this device, not in a point visit every four months, and the devices cost about $60,000, but to stream information from this amazing life-saving device every day. And what we showed that people live longer, those that are, have the device and are connected to a network where you're getting data every day versus those that don't. And that kind of set up a light bulb in my head. Why can't we do this with wearables as wearable sensors are becoming more and more important? And why can't we integrate health with the rest of a person's digital life? And then, of course, you know, better lucky than good. Then things started to mature with cloud storage, ubiquity of mobile um, in AI and analytics that would really allow us to deliver on the value of personalized individual on-demand care, not just this point visit and the ability to extend our experts all over the world. Um, it's not like I'm an America's firster, but I firmly believe that we have the best medical system in the world and the, the most democratic one. We just don't connect the dots very well, and it really frustrates the hell out of me as a subspecialist. I think we can deliver the best outcomes, not just for Americans, but to the world's population. I think we can lead this area as we have in tech. So there's a convergence that I think is occurring now I'd like to talk a little about, a bit about in terms of where I think it's going. So we've got these amazing body-worn sensors, AI networks, and more and more humans willing to be able to make that digital analog or that connection with the machine um, sort of human interface. And early studies showing that people in a, even a therapeutic environment or a diagnostic environment will trust a virtual human or an AI system to deliver a more continuous model of care because that's the kind of service model that healthcare must have and that we can't deliver through point visits. And, you know, really healthcare is about subspecialty expertise in a lot of ways when you get really sick. It's the specialists that actually have to deliver some of the outcomes. So how do we, how do we make that happen without having to continually train people? Even in this country, we only have about 60% of the oncologists we need. So how do we do this for the world? Um, one of the great things that's sort of um, constituting this convergence is that traditional um, care is trying to disrupt itself. So finally, healthcare systems are looking to digital to extend their brand to deliver more value for less. And a lot of that's because of affordable care, a move away for, uh, from fee for service, and a lot of tech companies are getting into healthcare because they have the software and services solutions to bring great value and transform global care. And this isn't just a, a you know, um, a sort of privileged elite type of, type of system I'm talking about. It's really healthcare for the world, delivering on one of our most basic human rights. And I, one of our specialties, and maybe this is why I think it's important, but I think sensors below or above the skin are really going to drive this, and even sensors and devices that can be co-opted and platforms used for healthcare. In some ways, the wearable sensor um, area is very interesting because the business model is sort of um, not there and the technologies outstrip the business model. So all the sensors on the top, body-worn, are sort of gone because of market forces or other things. And so 
the body-worn sensors that are sort of slugging it out, and Fitbit maybe has the biggest footprint, but their year-to-year -year sales have declined, and 25% of America has some kind of sensor. But at the low end, this Chinese company is out me at $30, just a pedestrian activity sensor with a pedometer. It gives you kind of directionally how much you're doing or makes you aware of your activity. Whoop, really trying to have an activity sensor that drives into the elite sports market. They may have some important implications for business models. And then the sort of elitist device, you know, the Apple Watch, which is now also becoming the Apple phone, right? But that creates an incredible value because it provides the hardware, the sensors, the, and the platform for really delivering on the promise of continuous diagnostic and connected healthcare. Interestingly, we, of all the sensors that we've tested, we've tested a lot of really accurate physiologic sensors. Um, in an elite marine unit at Camp Pendleton, we're using the Apple Watch. That's a, um, a swim that one of these elite marines did in the training just down the, down the beach from here at Coronado. Um, and that's tracking his heart rate throughout that various ocean swim, which is a standard that they have to do. But we're using this platform that Apple offers, not only the sensors within the watch, but the ability for trainers to get a dashboard of people on Apple's care kit, the ability to deliver to these, to these young warfighters and training information when they're not when they're not on these difficult standards that encourages them and helps them get through this difficult task and builds resiliency not just physical and insights but cognitive and psychological resiliency hopefully uh, to better protect them and make them successful there are a bunch of other sensors that I think are really going to profoundly change healthcare. This is a recently approved sensor by Abbott Laboratories called the Freestyle Libre. It's a continuous glucose sensor that's highly accurate. You can wear for two weeks, go in water or anything with. And you can check your glucose multiple times a day with the swipe of a smartphone. They've shown in early data with the sensor that diabetics get better control with just this diagnostic device of their, one of the measures of diabetic control, something called hemoglobin A1C, than with many diabetic drugs. So just the diagnostic, just leveraging the patient, allowing them to see, to connect the dots between their activity, their carbs, their, their insulin, gets better control of blood sugar. So again, these sensors and these solutions and software that enfranchise the patient and deliver outcomes are very important. This is a study we did with an iPhone-enabled ECG, was which most of you probably know of, by, made by a company by, named AliveCore, but we just gave this, this ability to get your EKG enabled by your iPhone to 1,100 people without a real app experience. Just record your EKG, record your grandmothers, record your dogs. It was approved for veterinary use, and people really engaged with it, and it drove them to medical visits, and they used it, whether they were checking their partying, whether they were checking their activity, whether they're diagnosing their malignant heart rhythm, it's a really important engagement tool, and it's very accurate. It has automatic algorithms. I just think this shows an incredible appetite and ability to build understanding in patient communities. And my patients use this and I do less work because they learn themselves and then we're actually, you know, really partnering and getting somewhere. We were really happy to be part of the LA 2024 and now 2028 Olympic bid. We're going to help the Olympic Committee understand how to light up Olympic Village from a body-worn sensor biometric standpoint. And that's not really a health play. That's not really how they're going to do with their individual countries and their individual fields. That's really more of a media play. How do you get young people watching the Olympics and interested in archery by sort of lighting up the athletes and creating these new experiences around biometrics? I think that's very interesting. Um, virtual care and virtual assistance, some people think they're to medicine as the internet was to kind of society. So what's the next wave of things that are really going to deliver for this continuous medical care idea? And this is a virtual care, virtual human that can diagnose and intake a returning warfighter with PTSD. What's interesting about this area of virtual human agents, um, sort of powered by voice recognition AI, is it turns out that People returning from war actually just close more to this virtual human guy who they can customize or woman or whomever they want than they do to a real intake psychologically psycho, uh, psychotherapist. And they're, probably the reason is the judgment's out and they're delivering the data on their own time when they're ready. We try to leverage a lot of that understanding toward healthcare. So what I'm talking about is a virtual care system that's really surrounding the patient and franchising the patient more than healthcare does using ubiquitous devices like phones and the sensors in them that creates a whole level of autonomy and privacy for patients that's enabled by body-worn sensors above or below the, s the skin that's contextualized to really, and has multiple feeds from every area of your life because nutrition matters, where you live, what you've done that day, all that kind of kind of stuff. Asynchronous access to experts. What I mean by that is that service model of medicine so that I can, as a 
subspecialist talk to the doctor in Vermont, the patient, the referring doctor, and the other 13 people in one text conversation or something else, and have patients feel that the same way and feel like they're cared for, and to create this non-judgmental um, environment around a patient. So I'm going to show you the virtual me that we created with voice recognition AI. This is a me that has 2,600 questions pre-programmed in her about the my subspecialty, one of my areas of atrial fibrillation for a patient that after they see me, and you know, they're naked in the room and I deliver my spiel, they can call up my expertise or their family member can any any time. And this is what that sort of Wouldn't looks like with my virtual and human. To have your doctor available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The proposed DocOn app, currently being developed by USC's Center for Body Computing and Institute for Creative Technologies, brings the convenience and reassurance of a personal doctor right to your smartphone. With DocOn, no matter where you are, you're only one click away from your own expert medical professional. Hi, I'm cardiac electrophysiologist Dr. Leslie Saxon, your personal 24-7 atrial fibrillation expert. I'm here to answer your questions. How can I help you? How does this work? Ask me anything about atrial fibrillation. I can understand human speech. Okay, well, what is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is a rapid and irregular rhythm occurring in the upper chambers or the atria of the heart. And how do I know if my occasional rapid heartbeat is due to AF? I'm only here to answer questions, not diagnose. If you are experiencing some symptoms, call your doctor or call the real me. If you'd like to know what symptoms to look for. You can see that that's an early prototype. We have to show that that's safe and effective. That virtual human learns that patient and is able to follow her through time. Your individualized concierge doctor through AI algorithms and you add diagnostics onto that, EKG and other things, and it becomes a really, it becomes kind of the better me on many levels, and then when I actually need to intervene and do a procedure or something on that patient, I can. So that's the value of having the AI driving that, that virtual human. I can also update her at any time with new information. Um, what I'm going to talk about is some of our elite athletic work and the ability that we have to, so if you take elite athletic training, which is, I'm going to show you a study we did with, with music, and you look at elite athletes, a lot of times they're listening to music, right? And a lot of times they're listening to hip hop. So in this study, we use biometric sensors in elite division one bound high school athletes over th two days to try to understand how altering bass tone in a hip hop playlist impacted elite high endurance, high intensity training. I'll just show you what that work looked like. And it turns out that it really did impact it. So at the margins, we could actually make a difference. So we can play that now. So real EKG, respiratory rate, thoracic impedance, the amount of work they did on each of these drills, sleep, pain, performance, all determined by the randomization piece, which was the amount of bass in the music. And we were able to show that the amount of bass actually mattered for these. These, these were all male athletes, football, and tennis, and baseball. It's the kind of studies we, we do in the center. Um, another area that we're working in is in activity sensing is this is a partnership. We just published this data that we did with one of the largest insurers of eye care in the country, um, VSP, and they put a sensor into the prescriptive eyewear. So an activity sensor into a medical device and we help them develop an app to try to figure out what are the behavioral characteristics that keep people within an experience because 25% or 50% of Fitbits are in the drawer at six months, right? Is that because people learn themselves? Is that because the behavior degrades? What are the behavioral characteristics that keep people in? And um, what we showed was that it's not always altruism. Sometimes it's narcissism. It depends on the person that keeps you in an experience, but that social communities and your baseline personality traits can be co-opted to keep you within something and to develop a healthy habit. And that social networks and this asynchronous communication were a huge part of that. And that will hopefully, doing this research, help, research help VSP develop a robust product. A lot of what we do at the center and a lot of where I think that this is going is more holistic health solutions. So we've partnered this year with AARP and United Healthcare and Lyft to try to tackle outcomes in the elderly. There are like four million missed appointments amongst the elderly to healthcare systems. But that's only part of the problem of social isolation and the things that really predict adverse outcomes in the elderly. So what we're going to do in this study is we're going to offer the elderly three months of free, free Lyft 
you know, free lift rides, not just to their medical appointments, to Whole Foods or to their granddaughters, wherever they want to go. And we're going to measure healthcare outcomes more holistically in terms of where they go and what they do. We're also going to track their activity. VR and AR is a, is a brave new world for medicine. It's largely unproven, not even proven to be safe, but very compelling because it's immersion and it can really create a lot of understanding and trust with providers. It can create distraction for painful situations for patients and deep learning as well as empathy. So we've worked a lot with VR. We continue to study it and to work on standards for safety. I would just say that um, it's promising. It's particularly promising in the same ways it's proven out for the military and people who've been traumatized, say by a di diagnosis or procedure, to put them in an immersive environment and try to help them get the best, best health care outcomes they can after a radical prostatectomy or a mastectomy or whatever you're, it is that you're trying to address, and particularly the adjustment disorder afterward. So what about voice assistants? These are really promising. Um, they, because they can provide personalized assistance in the home. Think about elderly people or disabled people. This is maybe a way to build that digital, that, that ramp to digital medicine that, that so many disabled or elderly people are left out of the traditional healthcare. How do we use voice assistance? And we're working like everybody else is now that these APIs are semi-open and trying to understand how to maximally support and inform people uh, in the home in a creative way. So we're almost done. I'm just, I never thought, if you asked me a year ago if I'd be spending a third of my time on this issue, issue, I would have said, no way, I don't know anything about it. I still know very little about it, but I'm an expert in, in terms of medical cybersecurity because, you know, the Achilles heel of digital health is somebody can hack into your body, and that's pretty scary, or hack your record. It's not just knowing your information, it's changing your blood type, right? So this is a scary area that's starting to happen all over, so we need to be mindful of this. The first time the devices, kind of devices I implant, came under an FDA safety advisory, and now they're getting a firmware update for um, theoretical risk of being able to hack into an implanted device. It's never happened. It's become a labor issue in the NBA. NBA players will not wear body-worn sensors unless they know they're accurate and the data's safe, and it's actually in their collective bargaining agreement that was left out. So that kind of impedes progress in the performance area. I've met, that's an ex-head of the CIA, Homeland Security. I can't believe I'm in that company, but there's a lot of learning in this country about cyber threats, cyber risks, and cyber protection, and that's why we're trying as, as a center to get into these areas and learn from these people how to make systems and patient information safe so we can deliver on this global, digital, continuous uh, model of healthcare. We're um, really happy to be chairing a governor's panel this year in cybersecurity and healthcare best practices with the best California companies so we can lead in cyber as we do in tech. And I would say I imagine a future of the globe that we're all healthcare is connected. It starts when you're a baby. Your electronic medical record is continuous. When you're a child, you can call it. It will deliver information to you that will be shared, that we can learn from each other's healthcare, that we'll do large global studies that we will be able to have on-demand access to the best experts in the world, no matter where we live or how much money we have, and that this virtuous connected system will lead to uh, better health and understanding on the globe, in the globe, on the globe. Thank you. So just a quick question. Your center has really brought together a whole bunch of different folks, and you're really taking this into the clinic, improvising. You've got folks here from around the world. Some have major academic centers and beyond. What, what, what lessons would you take real briefly that they could kind of clone or I've never I, you know I never bought into the kind of like more care for every everybody needs a vax everybody needs high end subspecialty care everybody needs the four seasons so I think we can deliver that high end care to every person on the globe with digital tools because digital radically reduces costs it's disruptive and it scales. So my view is never dumb down your solution, never try to keep patients out, never try not to engage them. Just give them service and give them what they need when they need it and connect, connect the data. Um, um, I've never been attracted to this, just like shuffle them through for less and, you know, because you know, I just don't think anybody wants that for themselves or for their 99-year-old father or anybody else. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah.